you can teach almost anything to almost anyone. Now, I could just tell you how, but that would be me modeling some very ineffective teaching techniques. So today, we're going to try two of them. I'm actually going to run through entire mini science lessons, and I want you to track along. The first one is going to be the power of the Big Bang. The second one's going to be the structure of an atom. Now, I know that both of those sound kind of boring on their own, but trust me, this is doable. Now, between those two, we're going to spend a little bit of time trying to figure out how I'm doing it and why we're doing it that way, because remember, by the end, I want you to be able to teach almost anything to almost anyone. So this is going to be kind of nerdy. Um, will you nerd with me? Yeah. Will you nerd with me? Okay. okay. All right, our first one, the power of the Big Bang. 14 billion years ago, a singularity exploded. But we can't start there. We can start here. This is a didgeridoo. Well, actually, um, th this is not a didgeridoo. This is a flaming didgeridoo. That's a didgeridoo. So um, this didgeridoo isn't played by blowing into it. This one is actually played with fire. Now, there is a difference between playing with fire and playing a musical instrument with fire, but not much. So this liquid that I'm dumping in right now is methyl alcohol. Uh, methyl alcohol is insanely flammable, and that's why I use it. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also probably on some sort of Homeland Security watch list. <laughs> now, what I wanted to do in there is I wanted to actually evaporate and become a gas, because that makes it even more flammable. That thing might be interesting. Just kidding. Um, you know what happens if I don't dump it out? Nothing. It's pathetic. OK. <laughs> now, we're going to give this a shot. So are you ready to listen? to the didgeridoo. Here we go. In three, two, one. <laughs> now, as interesting as that was, that was so not Big Bang powerful. Um, this is the USS Iowa. The USS Iowa in this shot it's firing all of its guns at the same time, and it has lots of them. It has nine 16-inch guns, and it has five more 6-inch guns. And they're all going off that way. Now, I love this shot because the force of the blast is actually pushing the water out away from the ship. Now, this kind of makes everyone's inner adolescent giggle a little bit. But this is not Big Bang powerful. OK, fine. Now we've got the sun. Now I picked this shot because this is a video of something that the sun did in 2012. Now I want you to watch the right hand side of the screen for a moment because the sun is doing this thing called a coronal mass ejection. Squirt. <laughs> now that piffing little squirt that you just saw was 15 billion tons of stuff shooting out from the sun at 5 million miles an hour. Now, if you're having a hard time picturing what 15 billion tons of stuff is, imagine the USS Iowa, but not firing something, being fired. Not one of them, 220,000 at 5 million miles an hour. Now, I picked this one because in 2012, that coronal mass ejection intersected Earth's orbit. We were one week away. Ooh. Now, that would have obviously given all those preppers some sort of vindication. But for our purposes, even though that is now kind of scary and powerful, it's not Big Bang powerful. OK, fine. X marks the spot. Please follow that with your eyeballs, OK? This is a video taken from the inside of the Milky Way galaxy. And right there in the middle, there's stuff going on. Now, we're going to zoom in because this is a big deal. And I want you to watch the star on the top. Come circling along and whoop. Now, that lovely little whoop that you just saw was S2. S2 is 15 times larger than our sun, and something was accelerating it to 11 million miles an hour. For the uber nerds among us, that's 6% of the speed of light. Something was accelerating something. 15 times bigger than our sun to 6% of the speed of light. Now, what has that kind of horrifying power? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you our very own supermassive black hole. 
That is called super, I'm sorry, it's called Sagittarius A star, and it is a supermassive black hole. It's actually the, the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. And it has no problems taking S2 and flinging it around like a toy on a string. Now we're approaching horrifyingly powerful now. And that's not Big Bang powerful. Okay, which brings us now to the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Now this shot was taken a little while ago but by a bunch of astronomers who essentially said, what would happen if we aimed Hubble at a dark spot on space for 10 days? Now before you start thinking that this was like a big spot, if you take a tennis ball, you set it down, and you walk 150 yards away, you turn and you look back at the tennis ball, it's a tiny little green speck. That's the same angle size as this shot. And in this shot, what do we find? 5,500 galaxies, almost each of which has their very own supermassive black hole at the center. You see, 14 billion years ago, a singularity exploded. And that is Big Bang powerful. Now, I hate to, like, interrupt these moments. This is one of the reasons why I love teaching. But what, what just happened here with, with, with us in this room? We went from a fact being kind of sterile and cold to experiencing maybe a sense of awe? Well, we did three very distinct things. We started off with a common experience, and then step by step, each time referring back to the last step, we went through, and that brought us to a real sense of understanding. Now, there's one guy to whom none of this would come as any sort of big surprise. This is Lev Vygotsky. Lev was a Soviet psychologist in the 1920s. And his life's work was in education. And he came to a few conclusions. So, number one, he said, all learning is cultural and historical. Whatever you've experienced in the past has determined where you're at right now. And this is vital because then you can only move forward according to your zone of proximal development. Essentially, how big a step can any one student take at one time? It might be a big step. You can teach them a lot from that one place that they're at. But maybe another kid, it's more like this. Oh, look, they got to the same spot. And the same spot is understanding. So if this is what we're going to do, then let's, let's do this. Let's use this and teach this way. First of all, you've got to start with your students wherever they're at. Those students have backgrounds, they have cultures, they have loves, they have hates, they have fears. And if you can't meet them there, you're going to have a really hard time teaching them anything. You've got to know where they are, because as a teacher, that's where you start. You don't start at whatever grade level. You don't start at whatever. You start with the student. And then, step by step, you lead them in student-sized steps. Don't lead them in curriculum-sized steps. Don't lead them in teacher-sized steps. Student-sized steps, whatever they're capable of. And then hopefully, we can get to real understanding and a sense of wonder. They'll love this stuff. And they'll really experience the wonder that's inherent in the universe. All right, so this is the shtick. This is what we're going to try. And this time, you guys know exactly what to expect. So we're going to do this again. Are you ready? Oh, <laughs> yes. OK, so here's how this is going to work. <laughs> I'd like for you to imagine an atom. Just, just picture one in your head. Have you got something? Some of you have like something terrifyingly complicated, and some of you have this really, really simplistic thing. I don't know your backgrounds. So let's go to some place where I know we can at least all start, OK? The classic Rutherford model of the atom. Oh, we like it. This, this one's even colorful. But we've got these electrons orbiting, and we've got the nucleus in the center, and you go, oh, great, that's what an atom looks like. It's no, atoms don't look like that. I mean, yeah, there's something in the middle, and there's electrons, but oh, oh, 
And so when we picture reality, we're picturing lots of this and we're so wrong. So what does it actually look like? Okay, well, honestly, you see, electrons, they don't move in little circles. And they also aren't nearly that close. This one's cozy. So what we got to do, they move in these big clouds. And they're huge. And they're really, really far away, in fact. This is the 6f orbital of the lanthanide elements. And if you excite one of the lanthanide elements, it can actually make this. And this is where you're going to find your electrons. And I lost you. <laughs> it's funny. Some of you are like, what, where did your brains go? You just, what, what? <laughs> I see this in class all the time. That means that if a teacher teaches outside of those student size steps, they've lost their students, and their students won't ever come to that understanding. You've lost it. Now, if I was trying to teach you electron structure, that would be bad. But since I'm trying to teach you how to teach, this is good. This is called a non-example. Because you don't know what something is until you know what it's like and what it's not like. Contrast is the mother of clarity, and differences make a difference. So now you guys got to see, oh, don't do that. You're right. OK, don't do that. So let, let's back off. Let's see if we can start off with something that's actually a little bit more reasonable. OK? This is a hydrogen atom. It's the simplest one on the periodic table. Now, we've got the, the electron orbiting in this big spherical structure. Thank you. And we've got one proton right in the middle. All right, so let's get a concrete example. Let's just say that our proton was this big. All right, we have now blown up a hydrogen proton to this size. Awesome, way to go. That means that our electron would be about this big, for real. Now, where is it orbiting? Remember, it's supposed to be in some sort of sphere. It's here, because if we believe that first one, it would be right here. Is it the edge of the stage? Edge of the room, 30 miles away. 30 miles away. If, if this was the proton right here in the middle of this stage, 30 miles, something like that. In other words, this would be somewhere between Benson and Marana. <laughs> On average, it can be further. So what's in all that space? A tiny, tiny bit of, bit of photons, maybe some bosons, but really, nothing. Nothing at all. There is nothing in that space. That 60 mile in diameter sphere contains that ball, this ball, and nothing. What about air? No, air is made of atoms. Come on, work with me. It's just not going to happen that way. So, but wait a minute. Don't atoms make up everything? Isn't this building made of atoms that are mostly nothing? <laughs> Aren't you sitting in a chair that's made of atoms that are mostly nothing? What about the body in which you're sitting in the chair? <laughs> it's atoms that are mostly nothing. If we could somehow remove all that gap, we could fit a human body onto the head of a pin. It wouldn't change the weight of the pin. It'd be a very awkward pin. <laughs> but you see, your body is more space than stuff. Why does it weigh so much? <laughs> <laughs> now, quick, how do you feel right now? Weird, kind of strange? Like, I feel awkward now for the first time in a long time. Or maybe you just, I always feel this way. Whatever. <laughs> we finally got an emotional reaction, didn't we? We took atomic structure, and then we had a visceral reaction to this. That means you got it. You finally got it. Remember, we're emotional creatures. And if you're not engaging the emotions, you're only hitting a part. And that means you're not really learning it. So if we can do this... If we can do this, if we can get to real understanding, what do we do to get here? Step by step by step. And we started with some sort of shared experience. Plutarch, a uh, Greek historian, said, The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. 
Maybe sometimes if you want to start that fire, you should start with a flaming didgeridoo. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time.